Good morning. I'm Sean Kent Hayashi. One of my client coaching clients told me recently that leading feels a bit like playing with a jack in the box. They say, my team is cranking along, getting into really good work rhythm, and then, surprise, something new jumps out. Some people will delight in having a challenge pop up, a new toy to play with, while others will want to stuff it back into the box, say, no, thank you, let's keep things the way they are. So how do you lead both types of people? And how do you do it when you're not sure yourself what's coming next? That's what we're going to be talking about today. There are three key competencies to develop in yourself and in your teams when you don't know what's coming next. They are a growth mindset, futuristic thinking skills, and emotional intelligence skills. Many of you have heard these terms before, but today I'm going to explain why these three together guide teams through uncertainty and help them to be innovative. Show of hands. How many of you know how to program a computer? So look around the room. Now, how many of you believe that you could learn to program a computer given the time, motivation, and resources to do so? How many people know how to speak Japanese? And, again, how many of you believe that you could? Wonderful. It's not at all surprising that a group of people who attend a conference like this one, where you've come here to learn new things, that, that you believe in your ability to learn. You are a collection of people with a growth mindset, which already makes you more adept at dealing with an uncertain future for a few reasons. For one, it makes you more receptive to feedback. People who have a growth mindset tend to be more open to feedback because they want to continually improve and they believe that they can with some effort. They believe it is possible to collaborate and create new solutions. Yes, they might cringe a little defensively when they hear that something still needs work, but they don't stay stuck there. Habits can change, skills are learnable, and talent can improve with practice. These are people who, when faced with a failure, tell themselves, I'm either winning or I'm learning. They see themselves as navigators on a journey that can be an adventure. They roll up their sleeves, they get to work, and they persist until they reach their destination. People with a fixed mindset... According to Stanford University psychologist Carol S. Dweck, react differently to feedback because they tend to believe that you're either smart or you're not. If you're smart or talented, then it will come easily to you. They believe people who program computers are just naturally good at that kind of thing. And people who learn Japanese as a second or third language are just naturally gifted in languages. Fixed mindset people don't see themselves as having access to new paths of learning through persistence and grit. With a fixed mindset, critical feedback can be even more threatening because it directly challenges someone's sense of themselves and it assumes no amount of effort will change anything. Without the hope of improving through learning, fixed mindset team members will likely fear being labeled as incompetent or, worse, fired. It also has other important implications. Fixed mindset managers are not focused on developing others. They judge team members as competent or incompetent. They tend not to engage in coaching. And when employees do improve, they fail to notice. They also are less likely to seek 
or accept critical feedback from their employees. All of these things affect engagement, productivity, and turnover. Let's teach leaders, managers, and employees about growth mindsets and fixed mindsets. Bob was one of my bosses many years ago. Bob came to me and said, Sean, there's a book on my desk that I want to share with you. I'll be out of the office all day. Feel free to stop by and pick it up anytime. When I went to pick up the book, I noticed right next to it was a list of my flaws. We can laugh about Bob's method of giving me feedback. At the time, I was stunned. But in retrospect, at least he found a way to let me know what he was thinking. Bob did not have a growth mindset, and he did not know how to coach his team members. When they don't know what's coming next, this is the first competency leaders need to develop in themselves and in their teams. The only way to change quickly is to learn quickly. So what are strategies for shifting people from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset in organizations? Carol Dweck's recipe for growth mindset environment is present skills as learnable, convey that the organization values learning and perseverance, not just genius or talent, give feedback in a way that promotes learning and future success, and present managers as resources for learning. Now, I'm going to challenge that. I want to add a little more. While I love Carol's recommendations and think that there's merit to them, there's also some that are missing. So in a growth mindset organization, it makes sense to view everyone, not just managers, as resources for learning. People on the front lines see things that leaders don't see. We need to be talking to them regularly and listening with an openness to innovation. And model asking for feedback from the top down. If you model asking for feedback, others will begin to do the same. If you want someone to take your suggestions, you need to be open to taking theirs. If you own up to mistakes or to not knowing something, your team will feel safer to do the same thing. Create a learning culture where people grow faster. Encourage people to ask for feedback rather than to wait for it. This is a really big one. Last year, after doing some reflecting, I decided my New Year's resolution for 2018 would be to stop giving unsolicited feedback. When I announced this to my friends, there was a gasp from several people, and one of them jumped in to say, No, Sean, that is the best part about you. Please don't stop giving me feedback. I want your feedback. Some other people in my life had a different reaction that suggested they might be relieved. Their reaction spurred me to dig deeper into this issue. And one of the things I learned is that the brain reacts to feedback. Unless we have a growth mindset and we ask for the feedback, we really don't want it. We hate both giving it and getting it. So, encouraging people to ask for feedback rather than wait for it. Imagine a culture where people continually ask what they could be doing better instead of waiting someone to tell them. Asking for feedback reduces the resistance to it. It also lets the receiver control the pace of the learning. Leaders may not be providing feedback as frequently as you'd like. If you're responsible for asking for feedback, you can ask for it more frequently, grow faster, and adapt more quickly. When you don't know what's coming next, to thrive, you have to have a growth mindset. No matter what pops out of the box, you'll be able to feel confident that you can figure out a solution together. This leads to the second skill that's needed. The second important competency to develop is futuristic thinking. To illustrate the power of this skill, 
when I was just about to graduate from college, I was invited to be a part of a focus group. There were about 20 other participants, and we were all sitting around a large conference table. We were asked to imagine a phone, one that you could carry with you wherever you went. We were asked, how would you use it? After much debate, we unanimously agreed we would not use such a device. Those of us in that focus group couldn't see the possibilities a mobile phone would offer. We were so convinced we didn't want to be disrupted during our free time that we didn't bother to envision the many upsides to having a mobile phone. Somehow, another group of people saw what we couldn't see. They connected the dots between a more mobile society and the possibility of communicating without landlines. In my work as an executive coach, I now know that the creators of the mobile phone had an important skill, the skill of futuristic thinking. Futuristic thinking is the ability to imagine, envision, project, and predict what has not yet been realized. Like Most skills, it's one that we can measure in individuals and in organizations. But here's something really interesting. I use a series of assessments, and we're able to identify 25 skills needed for leadership. Futuristic thinking is one of those skills, and it is the least developed in our population. Less than 3% of the U.S. population has some mastery of this skill. If futuristic thinking is the least developed skill among the population, then most of us aren't even thinking about what's coming next. We're not thinking about it, and as a result, there's a likelihood we will be blindsided by it. Those that are thinking about what's coming next are the ones who are working on it. They're not just waiting for the future, they're creating it. We operate a lot like this. Can anyone relate? This raises some questions that are useful to ask ourselves. How many of us are hindering the growth of our organization because we lack the skill of futuristic thinking? And how many of us are listening to the people who have developed this ability? What can we do to cultivate futuristic thinking in our leaders and in our teams, so that we're creating the future instead of resisting it. When you don't know what's coming next, you at least want to look around the corner, right? If so, you'll want to develop futuristic thinking skills. How do you do that? Well, raise everyone's awareness of the skill of futuristic thinking. Not just leaders. How? For individuals, introduce the concept in professional development conversations. Ask questions like, what could you learn now that will help prepare your role for the future? And what tools and abilities will you need in three to five years? Futuristic thinking goes hand in hand with a growth mindset. For teams, you want to introduce the concept in strategy conversations about what our ideal future is. Ask, how will our customers' needs change in one, three, five years? And what can we work on now to meet those needs? Listen to the futuristic thinkers in your organization. Invite them to your team meetings. Apply futuristic thinking to current trends to anticipate disruption and identify opportunities. Once you've raised everyone's awareness of futuristic thinking on both a personal and organizational level, that's when it's time for step two. When you see yourself as a navigator, you are an adventurer. You begin to pay attention to how the world is changing. Let's consider some examples of how others connected the dots to create new opportunities. How many of you were told when you were growing up that you should never talk to strangers? Yep, look around the room. Most of us were told that. 
And now, how many of you are getting in the car with Uber drivers you don't know? Or staying in the homes of Airbnb where, again, strangers with you. Why are we suddenly so comfortable with strangers? It's because of peer review platforms and online rating systems that have changed the way we think about interacting with strangers. TripAdvisor has changed the way I plan where to eat, what to do on vacation, and these platforms have also changed what it means to be an expert. We trust reviewers on social media more than we trust marketing brochures and materials. This societal shift and the new sharing economy are causing major disruptions and opportunities for positive innovation. So here's the deal. You already knew everything I said in the last few minutes, but I wanted to make sure that you could connect with something that you already knew. Because... Peer review platforms that you understand are just one of eight disruptors on the horizon that have already impacted and will continue to impact every industry, all companies. So changing demographics, climate change, big data, fast data, urban regeneration, peer-to-peer platforms, advances in technology, blockchain, and energy generation and storage. Encourage everyone in your organization to talk about these trends. Without their potential impact, the best ways to respond may not be obvious. This is another way to raise people's awareness of futuristic thinking and have them actively apply it. Here's some other ideas. Post questions related to trends in communal areas to get people thinking Encourage people to share news articles in which the eight major trends appear. Ask how will this impact what our customers will need. Hold semi-annual meetings to discuss what you're seeing with these trends and how you believe they will impact your team, your company. A coaching client of mine wanted to learn this skill. And I taught him the skill by first asking him to imagine something that he wanted to create. I I ask my coaching clients, if your life was wildly successful three years from now, what would be different? And one of his things that would be different was that he would have a beach house. So I said, all right, let's imagine you're sitting in your beach house. What would have happened just before that? I use post-it notes and Each time the person says something, I write down and I begin to post it up on the wall. I ask the question, what would happen right before that? And what would happen right before that? Until we get to the point where the person says, well, gosh, Sean, we're sitting here together. That's what was right before that. Then what we do is we go back through it from the front end and we see if we've missed anything. And inevitably, as someone gets to working on it, I say you're going to bump into things that you didn't know on the day you started, but you've got to start somewhere. So building a resilient strategy. How do you build a strategy? Well, identify a range of potential future states based on these eight disruptors that are most likely to impact your business. Evaluate how your current strategy will perform in these future scenarios. Work back from the imagined future states to the present. How would the world get to the future state? What are the markers along the way? What resources, capabilities, and real options can you build now to be agile and prepare for these different scenarios? How will you evaluate the investment in these options? These are general suggestions. Uh, Frankly, we don't have time today in our hour together to look at how each of these disruptors will play out in every industry. But you now have some steps for developing futuristic thinking skills and noticing it in others. So this leads us to emotional intelligence. The third competency to develop. Before I dive into emotional intelligence, I want to do one thought experiment. Do you remember one of the disruptors was blockchain? Raise your hand if you know what blockchain is. Most people that I encounter aren't quite sure. Uh, They may know that blockchain makes crypto 
currencies like Bitcoin possible. But now imagine that it's your job as head of human resources to figure out how to pay employees using Bitcoin. What are you likely feeling if you were challenged with an assignment like that? Could it be this? Or is it this? What you feel has an enormous impact on your ability to innovate. If you love change and thrive on it, your brain is firing. If you're overwhelmed, your brain is going into fight or flight. Leaders need to understand this if they're going to help their teams work through uncertainty to create new solutions. This is why emotional intelligence is another key competency for leading when you don't know what comes next. People who are emotionally intelligent understand how to use their emotions to perform at their best. They know intuitively what research has confirmed. The best creative thinking, the best problem solving, hey, even the best golf swing. These best performances happen when we're in the top of the emotional ladder. When we're marinating in the emotions of love, joy, hope, passion, excitement. Individuals or teams stuck at the bottom range of the emotions ladder in habitual envy, sadness, anger, or fear will have an uphill battle in producing results. There are seven chemically identifiable emotional states in the human body. Love, joy, hope, these are those walking on sunshine feelings that we really love and we want to keep the momentum going when we're there. But there are four other emotional states, sadness, envy, anger, and fear, and we need to learn how to process ourselves through those so that we don't get stuck in them. You can move yourself up the ladder with the right questions. So it's important to know that you can do that and to know what those questions are. An emotional hijack can derail us for hours unless we know how to process ourselves through our emotions. You can learn to self-regulate. Once you recognize fear, you can take positive steps to address it head on. By asking yourself the right questions, you can move yourself out of fear into an emotional state where you're better able to think and problem solve. You'll want to do this for yourself and you'll want to know how to help others do it as well. If this is you, on the other hand, it may be important to realize that not everyone on the team will feel as you do with bubbly excitement. Emotional intelligence isn't just knowing how you feel. It's anticipating how others feel as well and communicating in ways to keep people at the top of the emotional ladder. In my book, I share practical strategies for keeping yourself and others, moving up the ladder. I provide the specific questions to process yourself through your emotional experiences. There are three strategies for evoking a positive emotional response. Self-talk, mindsets, and emotional wake. Let's look at each. Self-talk. How you label, how we label, what we are experiencing has a huge impact on us. The starting chemical marinade of excitement and fear are the same. What we label it determines if the chemicals in our bodies turn into excitement or fear. This could sound like, hey, what an adventure it will be creating a new payment system using Bitcoin versus, ugh, this is going to be a huge problem. I don't know if I can handle this. We've talked about how a growth mindset changes how people view their capacity to learn. Negative mindsets impede our capacity to problem solve. Emotionally intelligent leaders and teams intentionally shift people out of negative mindsets into more positive ones. In workplaces with high-performing teams adapting to rapid change, there's been a shift in how people understand their roles. Here's how I describe it. The employee mindset versus the work stakeholder mindset. 
When we're in an employee mindset, we ask questions like, when do I have to work? 9 to 5 or 2 to 10? We're in rigid work schedules. In the work stakeholder mindset, I say, what are the deliverables? We create flexible work schedules that we allow people to manage for themselves. In the employee mindset, what's my job? If it's not my job, why should I do it? We're not as invested in the team's success, or we may be worried about stepping on somebody else's toes. Work stakeholder mindset, what are we committed to accomplishing? How can I contribute? We're invested in the team and the mission success. In the employee mindset, who will tell me what to do? We expect top-down communication versus in the work stakeholder mindset. Who's making the decisions? How can I lead in my area of expertise and initiating collaborative communication? In the employee mindset, what if I do something wrong? Will I be blamed? We avoid risks. We finger point. We have a cover your ass approach to work versus the work stakeholder mindset. Let's learn from our experiences. Let's learn quickly. It's okay to fail fast. We believe in experimenting and learning from experiences together. So what does all of this mean for you? If strategy is on the agenda and you're thinking, huh, business strategy really isn't my department, then you're in an employee mindset. If strategy is on the agenda, a work stakeholder will be thinking, what insights could I share from my perspective that can help shape the company's direction and lead to success? Who owns this decision and how can I be supportive of that person seeing this view that I have access to? Emotionally intelligent leaders who want to create a culture of innovation interact with their teams and have teams interact with each other in ways that inspire those top emotions. And they also help them to know how to process through when they're not there. So you could say they create a positive emotional wake that makes innovation possible. How many of you have ever been on a boat? When you're looking out the back of the boat, what do you see? That's right, a wake. I propose that we have an emotional wake in relationships as well. Let me explain what I mean by this. How many of you had a grandmother? What was your experience of your grandmother? Some people talk about bingo games and apple pie and getting off the bus and the big hug from grandmom. That was not my experience. Imagine this. I was eight years old. I was put on an airplane and I was flown several states away. As I recall it, the first thing my grandmother did when she saw me was shake her head and say, nope, that long hair is not going to work. We're going to stop by the barber on the way home to get that cut off. When I arrived at my grandmother's house with very short hair, The next thing I remember is that she asked me what I had brought for summer reading material. I was so excited because I had Nancy Drew and Encyclopedia Brown and I couldn't wait to read them. But my grandmother again shook her head and said, nope, I have other reading material for us. On just about every flat surface were college admissions brochures. That's right, I was eight. I spent the summer reading college admissions brochures with my grandmother. Now, I don't want to leave you in that emotional marinade, but what might I have been feeling there? Sadness. That's right. Sadness is an emotion that uh, comes up when we feel like we've lost something, and I clearly was losing something. And uh, when we don't deal with our sadness, it turns into or it can become depression if we stay in it, right? Or the other option is we can move to anger, and anger is a signal that we've something has crossed our boundaries. And so we have to stop and ask ourselves, what's crossed my boundaries? And what do I want to do about it? Who do I need to talk to about it? But at eight years old, I didn't have the skills. I didn't have the know-how to craft the conversations that I would need to have in order to resolve the conflicts with my grandmother. So when we are sad and we don't deal with it, and then we are angry and we don't have the skills to deal with it, we land in fear. And fear is an emotion that says, I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I can do this. And that's clearly where I was with my grandmother for a long time. 
So again, I don't want to leave you sitting in that story. Let me tell you another one. Julie and I, when I first graduated from college, I moved to the Philadelphia area and I was working in an environment that I really enjoyed and had the opportunity to work with Julie. Have you ever had a friend where you could just finish each other's sentences and you just really connected? That's how I felt with Julie. One day over lunch, I said to Julie, hey, I don't know where you went to college. And she said, being an East Coast girl, you've never heard of it. I said, try me. I've read a lot of college admissions brochures. She said, okay. Northfield, Minnesota. I said, which one, Carleton or St. Olaf? She said, hey, is, is your grandmother Elizabeth Tomlinson? Julie, how do you know my grandmother? She said, oh. She was my mentor. I just love her. She's amazing. Sean, are you the granddaughter she took to Japan? Oh my goodness, you're so lucky. Now, what do you think I'm feeling in that moment? This is about emotional marinades. I had a completely different emotional wake with my grandmother that Julie did. How does this happen? Building a positive emotional wake takes five positive emotional experiences to dilute one negative emotional experience. So in relationships, when we want relationships to grow and thrive, we need to be intentionally making deposits. You see, the interactions with my grandmother felt more like withdrawals, whereas for Julie, they felt more like deposits. And what happened was I decided I wanted to intentionally change my relationship with my grandmother. And I began to see her. We, in fact, we went to visit her together. And I, I began to see my grandmother through Julie's eyes and to see that her developmental comments were meant to be helpful to me, were meant to be deposits in my emotional bank account, not withdrawals. Using positive self-talk, mindsets, and emotional wake are important tools, but even they won't work 100% of the time. Resistance will show up. It showed up in the focus group when we debated the merits of a mobile phone. We could not see the possibilities due to our own resistance. But the designers of the mobile phone did not let our reaction stop them from moving forward. They believed the benefits far outweighed the intrusion on our free time. Ah, And they were right. I'll talk more about combating resistance in a minute, but first I want to do another experiment with you. Even though you didn't ask to do this, imagine that right now the spotlight up here is put on you, and you are invited to come up on stage to dance the hula, the macarena, or an Irish jig. Sit with that idea for just a moment. Breathe. Notice your feelings. What are you feeling? Some of you are excited. You like to dance. Others of you are saying, have you lost your mind? Can I get out of this room fast? All of these emotions mm, can feed into resistance. What conditions would have to exist for you to let go of your resistance? Would it help if I did it with you? If I cleared the room first? If I invited 50 other people on stage to do it with you? If I sent you to a hula class? If I explained that your hula dance would cure someone with cancer? Anyone spot any useful strategies here for combating resistance? When we need to combat resistance, notice when it shows up, Paint a positive vision, emphasize organizational continuity, and lead by example. Let me go a little deeper into each. When I got off the stage from having delivered my TED Talk, my son's first comment was, that was horrible. I'm surprised they didn't throw tomatoes. Make sure that video is not made public, Mom. I was stunned. I called several of my clients and friends to get their reaction, and they raved, saying it was great. Rather than letting my son's resistance to my ideas color my experience, I went back to him and said, hey, I'm really curious. Would you help me to understand 
what it was that I did or said that caused you to think it was horrible. By being curious about his resistance, that's how I learned that my son would prefer a monotone voice and no gestures. Now, when I ask him to clean his room, (laughs) we have to adapt to the people we're working with in order to be successful. So, notice when resistance shows up. There's another application of emotional intelligence competency here. It's being aware when you feel fear and anger. Notice when resistance shows up in yourself and watch for signs of it in your team. Ask questions to get under it and to learn from it. The questions I asked my son helped me to understand his resistance and to process it to find a solution. Second, paint a positive vision. Show people what's possible and avoid focusing on the possibility of failure. One study from the University of Chicago found that simply communicating the probability of success increased the chances of success. And what's the best way to communicate positive vision? It's through storytelling. Stories connect with emotions on a deep level. What are you likely to remember about my presentation today? The stories, right? Third, organizational continuity. An article in the Harvard Business Review found people worry that disruption will fundamentally change what they love about their organizations. They fear that after the change, the organization they value and identify with will no longer be the same. Emphasizing the who we are part of the organization as it will stay the same is a useful strategy for growing companies and changing departments. And finally, lead by example. Show people how to react to change in a healthy way. Demonstrate your own growth mindset by asking for feedback and listening in a way that makes it safe for people to share concerns and problems. You don't have all the answers either, but together you'll figure out a way forward. Stay focused on solutions and communicate what excites you about creating together. So to recap, these are the three competencies to develop in yourself and in your teams. A growth mindset for creating a culture of learning, futuristic thinking for connecting the dots to see what's possible down the road, and emotional intelligence for keeping yourself and those you're leading focused on solutions. None of us knows what's going to pop out of the box, but with these competencies, we can feel more confident in our ability to handle whatever it is. If you are looking for additional resources, my books are available in the bookstore. I also invite you to check out my YouTube channel, The Professional Development Group. And this is how you can contact me. Happy to take questions now.